everybody. Welcome to Economics with the Honorable David M. Walker. I'm Nick Palavita. I'll be your host for today. Um, David may or may not be joining us. We switched to StreamYard 1 for this particular broadcast. And I think next week we're basically going to be back on StreamYard 2. So we'll just have to see how things go from there. But we do have our, our panel. And let's see, we do have some comments about joining the conversation on it. Uh, and uh, let's bring in our panel to discuss our topic for today, which is the economic forecast in 2023. Now with that, uh, we hope to have Dennis Stearns, who's the uh, chair of the Stearns Financial Group, who's done our economic forecast for the last few years on a, a special program to uh, get the economic forecast for 2024. But with that, we have a person who does have a crystal ball. He uh, actually is the chair of the Eid Foundation in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, a chess master by trade, and um, also an author of Chess for Dummies, which you can purchase on the Pod TV bookstore. Just go to podtv.tv, and our partnership with Amazon allows you to purchase the book. And with no further ado, we bring in Jim Ead, who will never change my mind, but you can probably <laughs> change people's minds. It's an inside uh, job. What? <laughs> It's an inside job. Look for love to change your mind. Oh, well, you're going to change somebody's mind. Well, no, you got to do it. I, I'm going to do it. No, I don't you, think so. You got to change your own mind, Nick. I I'm, can't I'm do it for you. Mud, buddy. It, it ain't going to happen. But we'll put a plug for your book. Thank you. Uh, from the Pod TV bookstore and buy chess for dummies for the people that don't know how to play chess. Now, this person, I'm not sure if he knows how to play chess, but he's really good at IQ test. Uh, one of the top <laughs> IQ performers in the uh, world, actually, and um, we're going to bring in a mega society member. No one knows what that is. It's if you're like way above the top 1%, way above Mensa. Uh, we'll bring in Rick Rosner from the southern part of California. Yeah, I, I'm too lazy for chess. Chess is hard work. Yes, I agree with you on that part. Somebody <laughs> asked, why don't you play? My brother, who's like an expert player, uh, and I'm like a master, goes, why don't you play in tournaments again? I said, Dude, it's a lot of work. Yeah, you know. And so the thing is, I said uh, I don't want to work that hard. When I was younger, I did because I always wanted to get better. But as you get older, you get lazier, and you just go no. And then when you start thinking about high IQ people, hey, it's really great. But guess what? A low IQ person does the laundry just as good as a high IQ. Yeah, no, the, and the, I matter. feel like chess. I feel like chess is a plot by lower IQ people to get higher IQ people to waste their time. So that, like mm. if everybody who plays chess decided to use their mental energy to go into real estate, they would drive out all the mediocre realtors. Right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You it, found this out. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a lot of work. And with this, we're going to bring somebody who also believes in hard work, a uh, person who is one of the founders of the Pod TV network, none other than Kim Calhoun. Uh, Kim, welcome to Economics uh, with David Walker. And I wasn't sure if David Walker is going to be on. He is going to be on. I see him backstage. All right. Uh, but with that, we're going to bring in two more guests from the Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina area. Uh, he's busy all the time, so I don't know if he's there. Well, Shaquille Latmer coming in from Australia. I'll just bring myself on, shall I? I can bring myself on. I don't know you have the power to do that. And then, of course, Mark Lee, who might be busy. Doing I'm not busy at all. Stage. I got a question for uh, David whenever he gets uh, here. Well, uh, D David's going to be here as soon as I bring my last panelist on, which is uh, Jatovi, who's the voice of the Carolinas. And with that, we're going to bring in the person who knows the most, a person who's going to try to keep our country from going bankrupt, which every time I bring it up, it's like deer in the headlights. And that is the Honorable David M. Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States of America. David, welcome to your show. Good to be so, back. Uh, yeah, well, we're, we're going to be discussing economic forecast in 2023. I'm hoping to get Dennis Stearns on a future one. Uh, we were supposed to have a guest on this one, but I don't know. He's he's a professor, and so I don't know if he's able to make it. I don't think he's going to be able to make it today. You know how professors are. They're busy. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at the economic forecast for 2024. We have an election year coming up. We have a country that has thirty-four trillion dollars in debt. I bring that other bit. Bring that other thing back up, please. That looks fantastic. Oh, that comment. <laughs> oh, Shaq, I love you. Hi, uh, Travis. Wait, 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 Shaq. This is not a dating site. So please, <laughs> come on now. Right, right. 
<laughs> we're trying to discuss serious business here. We, this we this have Travis is it's one of his very <laughs> well, well, I do. I do have to say, I've I've actually fallen substantially out of love with David M. Walker. Normally, I would say I really like David M. Walker, but I've changed my mind about this because he is trying to save the U.S. from bankruptcy, and I have a lot of bankruptcy lawyers. Um, and we can pick over the carcasses and get some great assets. So I actually think it'd be good for the US to go bankrupt. Let our lawyer law firm take over. Let us pick over the carcasses. It'd be, it'd be very profitable. So David, can I can I lobby you? Can I uh, can I get you to change your mind and, and to help the US go bankrupt so the rest of well, us can pick over? They're, the they're looking forward not to pay their debts in the next couple of weeks. But anyway, <laughs> I hate to to kill, but we're not going to go bankrupt. But we're going to have to make major changes and hopefully sooner rather than later. But uh, that's a restructuring. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe I could accept that if we could be involved. Yeah. David, David, speaking of which, and I said I was going to bring it up, but I didn't get to it on the news show, World Edition, everything. But there is a major airline that is in trouble because they had some issues with the way that they were constructed and everything. So I was just wondering, as a person that is in the Comptroller General space and has done the work in this industry, should we be regulating people like Boeing and folks like that? Because apparently there are some people that are like, I'm not flying a certain type of Boeing plane because of the issues that they have had and all along those lines. So I just wondered your thoughts around regulating particularly major industries like the train and the plane industry, because I did see that Boeing is in some hot water because of some things that were going on the way that their planes were constructed. <laughs> Well, they're, they're already regulated. The question is, is whether or not the regulation is effective or not. In many cases, you know, you have self-certifications for things. Uh, and that particular company who manufactured the plane involved, I think, is having a big stock today. And it's my understanding there's only a couple of airlines that purchased that aircraft. I think it was United Airlines and Alaska Airlines, and they've been grounded temporarily uh, in, in order to see what's going on. And I mean, keep in mind, it's a 737, but there are lots of versions of the 737, and there's only one version that's, uh, that's affected. I mean, for example, Southwest Airlines, I've got a good friend who's a pilot with Southwest. That's all they fly, 737s, but they don't fly the particular version that is uh, subject to uh, additional safety inspection right now. Um, you know, look, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, some <laughs> issues. And, you know, we had a over 5% GDP growth in the third quarter of 2023. We don't know what the GDP number will be for the fourth quarter of 2023. But let's face it, I mean, uh, a little over 5% uh, GDP growth in real terms is impressive. There's no question about it. However, you also have to look at what was fueling that. Uh, and to a great extent, that was fueled by several things. One, it was fueled by pent-up demand for consumption post-COVID, where people wanted to start taking vacations and doing things that they hadn't done for a while. Secondly, it was fueled by a significant increase in household debt. A lot of these things that people did, they put it on the credit card. And thirdly, it was it was fueled by a significant increase in federal debt, uh, you know, uh, if you will. And and those things are not sustainable. So I'm really looking forward to see what's going to happen uh, in the fourth quarter with regard to GDP. The other thing I'm interested in is. What's going to happen with regard to inflation? The latest inflation number that we have is 3.1%. Uh, most economists believe that it's going to tick up a little bit in December. We'll see. Uh, the numbers are supposed to be released on January 12th, as I recall. Uh, the Fed's uh, primary responsibility is to maintain stable prices. 3.1% is way down from the 9.1% in June 2022, but it's over 50% higher than the 2% target rate. Uh, and, and so I think you're not going to see an increase in the Fed discount rate in the short term. But I think people got a little over enthusiastic thinking that you're going to see a decrease in the Fed discount rate uh, in the near term. I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's imminent. Uh, it, it may or may not happen in 2024, uh, 20, uh, depending upon what happens with the economy, what happens with uh, inflation more than anything else. Uh, they reiterated, the chairman reiterated that 
he understands that their primary responsibility is to uh, is to deal with inflation. They're the ones that best positioned to do that. There is a check and balance now in Congress. Uh, you know, excessive spending has been checked somewhat uh, because of the b- because uh, the Republicans took control of the House. Um, you know, that's a short term measure. It looks like we may end up getting, a, you know, an appropriations agreement and avoid a government shutdown. Uh, we'll see what the, you know, whether that happens or not, but it, there's a tentative agreement on that. There's still not an agreement yet on the supplemental funding for, uh, for Ukraine, uh, Israel, and the border. Uh, and, and, you know, the Republicans are understandingly drawing a red line, which we'll see if they stick with it or not, saying that you got you know, you to deal with the border in a meaningful way. Uh, for national security, for uh, for public health, for you know uh, domestic tranquility uh, and other purposes, you've got to deal with it. So uh, we'll see what happens there. You know, one thing, and then we'll open it up. You know, I've got a new op-ed that I'm going to post. I've got several about ready to pop. One popped uh, just about an hour ago in 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 the DC Journal. I'm headed to. New, I'm headed to New Hampshire on Friday. I've got a couple of speeches in New Hampshire. And as you know, the New Hampshire primary comes up uh, here, uh, I think, two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, th- there's when I was down in Charleston, South Carolina for Renaissance weekend, you know, I had a lot of Democrats come up to me. And, you know, I'm a political independent. And I'm an equal opportunity complimenter and critiquer. A lot of Democrats come up to me complaining about how in the world could you be involved in no labels who might end up offering a third option. And I said, well, the, the reason is very simple. I said, you know, 69 percent of voters don't want Biden and 62 percent of voters don't want Trump. Uh, and if the parties gave us better choices, you wouldn't have to worry about us. Uh, but one of the things that they were really disconnected with is the economy. They keep on telling us that everything's great. Everything's great. You know, you're just not looking at the right stats. Well, let me just give you a few things off the top of my head, okay? Um, you know, economic growth we've just talked about, okay? Um, most people believe it's going to moderate significantly. Inflation, yes, inflation is down from the peak of 9.1%, but it's still going up. Uh, and when you look at what's happened to inflation between January 1 uh uh, January 21, 2021, 20, uh, which is when Biden was sworn in, inflation's gone up about 20 percent in that period of time. Uh, and if you look at certain segments of of, of, uh, of the economy, such as food and energy, they've gone up even more. For example, gas prices have gone up 36 percent during that same period of time. Uh, and so, yes, inflation is coming down, but the accumulated inflation that's taken place uh, is significant and is really hurting, especially the middle class. Real wages, yes, real wages started going back up the last couple of quarters, but they're down 5% since January 21, 2021. You know, uh, you know, and, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, a variety of other factors, it's not just a matter of where it is now versus where it's been. It's a matter of where it is now versus where it was uh, and, and what's like it happen? I'll give you one more off the top of my head. The S and P 500. The S and P 500 is up some somewhat over 20 percent since January one, uh, January 21, 2021. But net of inflation, it's only up three percent. Whereas under Trump, and as you know, I'm not a Trump fan. Okay, uh, the S and the S and P was up over 50 percent, and total inflation during the four years that he was in office was. Nine uh, percent, and so you have to understand where you are, where you've been, where you're headed, and how you compare, and that's where the disconnect is. Americans recognize where are they now versus where they were, and that's why you have a significant majority of Americans that, rightly or wrongly, say, "I'm not better off now than I was January 21, 2021," and we'll see what happens over the next year. But those are just a few thoughts. Okay. Just really quickly, and then I saw that um, Rick had his hands up as well. But 
I did see that there was an economist, and like I said, I don't know the economy, uh, the economist the way that y'all know him and everything, but he is a world economist that is saying that we are moving into a super cycle thanks to the artificial intelligence and decarbonization. And that was Peter Oppenheimer, who is apparently a head of macro research there with Goldman Sachs in Europe and everything. But I was just wondering your thoughts about this notion of the world economy and whether we are actually heading toward a super cycle, because he's thinking that those two issues could push us to this great economy boom that will be taking place. And they're saying that the last one we had was in the 70s, the early 70s through the 80s and everything. But is this something that is real? And he did bring up something that I brought up earlier, which is this notion of deregulation and privatization as well. So are we really heading toward a super cycle is my question for you, Dave. Well, first, you're not getting deregulation under this administration. <laughs> uh, that's not the case, all right? Uh, secondly, I do think AI has great potential. There's absolutely no question about that. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of upside and that can end up helping to push much more dramatic economic growth, much greater increases in productivity, but it's also likely to result in a lot of lost jobs too. Uh, especially things that, that, uh, you know, that are, are, are routine and redundant, uh, if you will. And that's not just with regard to blue collar, that's with regard to white collar, uh, as well. So. Uh, you know, so, so there are pros and cons there, um, you know, uh, on, on the environmental side, look, you know, uh, climate change is real and man contributes to that. There's no question about it. But a lot of the things that this administration is trying to do are totally unrealistic with regard to what they want to do within the time frame that they want to do it. Uh, and I think that we need to have a more realistic and balanced approach in how we're moving away from historical fossil fuels to more alternative energy. And you also have to recognize that people have to want to buy it. You know, there are lots of problems right now with regard to the fact that you have a lot of manufacturers that can't sell their EV vehicles, even with the significant tax credits that people are getting for purchasing them. So, uh, you know, it's a mixed bag is the bottom line. Okay. So um, one way to control inflation is for the lazy media to do it their job and shine a spotlight on price gouging by corporations. Half of inflation is due to, to corporations sneaking in price gouging, record profits for oil companies, record profits for supermarkets, and they can go ahead and do it, but people should be aware of it. And speaking of people being aware of financial stuff, I was thrilled outside a grocery store to sign a petition that to, to get on the ballot that in the state of California to graduate high school, you need a semester of financial literacy. That would be freaking great. I agree yeah. with you, Rick. And there's, you know, as you've heard me say yeah. many times, I think that you ought to be required to pass a, a course in financial literacy and another course in civic responsibility before you graduate from high school. Uh, only 14 states require a course in financial literacy. Mine is one of them, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, and I'm pleased to hear that California is trying to come on board too. I think it was Jim. Okay, I think Shaq, you had your hand up first, but I'd like to speak after you. Well, okay. Um, yeah, uh, you know, David, I have tremendous amount of respect for you. That you know, I think you're a real patriot and I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Um, but I think you had a, a uh, talking about Biden and inflation and Trump and inflation, you know, there there was a COVID pandemic that was That's global correct. in nature and it broke down the global distribution system. And so the inflation hit around the globe. It did not hit just the United States. And it's something that the president couldn't control. Um, <clears throat> so talking about the post Biden uh, inflation is really missing the mark. It's the COVID pandemic inflation that influenced the entire globe. And what we're seeing is that distribution system that was broken down has been rebuilt. And that is why we see inflation coming down to the levels. And yes, you know, we can use numbers to, to tell nasty little lies. You know, 3% is 50% higher than 2%, but it's way, way down. Yeah, sure. And it's sustainable. And <clears throat> I think it's sustainable because the global distribution system has been repaired. And that's the thing, independent of who's president of the United States. Yeah. Um, and the U.S. economy has rebounded from this in a remarkable way that is not 
been replicated around the world. The German economy has not bounced back like this. The British economy has not bounced back like this. Chinese economy has not bounced back. Um, <clears throat> you know, the United States recovery has been remarkable and it has not involved in a recession. And so I think the Fed raising the interest rates in response, which is a classic response to inflation, I agree, but it's usually because of an overheated economy, which was not true in this case. We did not have an overheated economy. We had a breakdown of the global distribution system. So now yep. when we can lower them without suffering, we're not trying to cool off the economy. None of that is ma matters. So I think lowering the interest rates is in everyone's interest because it will allow people to start small businesses again. It will help the economy overall. And um, to keep it artificially high is trying to artificially induce a recession. It makes no sense yeah. to me. I think it's this is let me let me let me let me jump in here and then let's go to Shaquille. Well, first, let me tell you how this discussion got started. Uh, it, 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 it got started because of unemployment statistics mm -hmm. and people asserting that Biden has done the best job of any president in modern history in creating jobs. All right. J James, I agree with you that COVID was the number one factor. I agree with you. And my, my, my comeback to them when they started with that was, have you ever heard of something called COVID? Because the fact of the matter is, is that most of the jobs that have been created since January 21, 2021, are recovery of jobs that existed prior to COVID, not new jobs. And when you adjust for the recovery of jobs that existed past COVID, you go from 410,000 jobs being created a month to 100,000. Well, that's still good. I mean, 100,000 new jobs is better, but people try to end up distorting what reality. Uh, the other thing that happened, I agree with you with the, the supply chain. I agree we have recovered quicker than others. Totally agree with that. But the other thing that happened is we spent way too much money. We've wasted at least a trillion dollars in what was spent, you know, during all, well, all that we did with regard to COVID, at least a trillion dollars. And uh, the Congress was also following the so-called modern monetary theory that, that it doesn't matter whether or not you run deficits or debt be, as long as you can borrow in your own reserve currency and less than until you have excess inflation. Well, that was one factor that helped contribute to excess inflation. But you're right. The supply chain was another. I totally agree with that. Right. So my only point is, let's be honest. OK, we have to look at where we are, where we've been, where we headed. And a good point that you may mention, which I talk about all the time, is how do we compare with others? If you don't really know all of those things, you don't know how you're doing. However, let's footnote it with this and then go to Shaquille. We're more sophisticated than most people on these issues. Okay? There are other people more sophisticated than us, but we are clearly above average on these issues. The American people are not. And when the American people are looking at these issues, they're looking at it basically the way that Reagan did in his reelection, okay? Uh, or, or as he did when he first got elected, I guess, too. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? And no matter what statistics we put out there, the American people will make a judgment on that based on their gut, no matter what the statistics are. And, and I think that's a reality, rightly or wrongly. That's I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Shaquille. Well, I'll just I'll address a couple of things. Um, I'll, I'll just start with, with this. I find it very fascinating that people talk about the economy doing really well. And one of the reasons that they give for why the economy is doing quite well is the stock market is doing well. But when Donald Trump was the president, everyone would say the stock market is not an indicator of the economy or the economy is not the stock market. So I think there should be some level of consistency there. But let's just come back to inflation because that's something that I think is a more fascinating issue. The majority of the world, the Western world, had a problem with not hitting inflation targets. They were trying to get to 2% and they couldn't do it. And this was a problem for at least a decade, maybe even 15 years um, that I'm aware of, where central banks kept saying, kept saying this. All of a sudden, we've actually had really a correction that if you add up the deficit in the inflation rate over the last 10 or 15 years, Prices are today what they should have been had the reserve banks and the central banks hit their targets. 
So I'm not too concerned that inflation is higher than what it should be right now if inflation is, in fact, heading downwards, which it is. When it comes to the US economy, though, I'm actually concerned about, and this might sound counterintuitive, about how strong the US economy appears to be right now. When you're investing in a market, especially if you look at macroeconomic investments, you look at what's going to grow more relative to something else. So if I think that the US economy is going to grow by 20%, that's really fantastic. But if I think that the rest of the world is going to grow by 30%, I'm going to short the US market and invest in the rest of the world. This is the problem that I th- I'm using extreme numbers there, but this is the problem that I think the US is going to face uh, coming into the future, which is that the rest of the world has lagged the US, but that's not going to last forever. At some point, those other countries are going to start catching up and they're going to experience higher rates of growth. And of course, the problem that I think is going to happen is that the everyday American is not going to understand the reasons for this. And it's going to become a political issue. The Republicans did this or the Democrats did that instead of that these are just natural cycles that happen within the economy. So I I do think that that's going to be a significant issue uh, coming up. A couple of other um, uh, issues that were brought up there. Um, I know, Dave, you're talking about us in relation to being more sophisticated, but I think from a country perspective, I think the United States tends to feel like they they have a, a level of understanding of worldwide economics that I don't think many Americans actually do. Yeah, and I don't. think that causes American foreign policy to sometimes miss the mark. And I think that can actually take Americans by surprise. And so from an international perspective, a lot of people have said to me, why do you love Trump so much? I'm like, when did I say I love Trump? I don't, don't love Trump. It's just I don't hate him. I just assess what I think his policies are going to do to the economy, just like I do with Biden. And then I give my opinion as to whether or not I think that's a positive or negative for the US. But because I'm not going to take a strong stance one way or another, and why would I? It's not my country, right? Because I won't take a stance one way or another, people have always put me in this like extreme right wing kind of perspective. What I think there's a problem with that is that people forget to look at these other issues that are affecting the economy, that are affecting people. You know, the, the people that like me who identify as being libertarians. You know, there are some clown libertarians out there that would suggest that healthcare isn't a responsibility that anybody has or that education isn't a responsibility that any of us have. Fine, if that's your opinion, no problems. But would you really like to live in a country where children with poor parents don't get an education or people that are poor don't get healthcare? Those are not the sorts of countries we'd like to live in. So I think that there's a balance And that balance has been missed because of the extreme polarisation of the political sides in most Western countries today, not just the US. So my my wife and I met with our accountant. We both lost our moms in the last couple of years and we inherited some income streams and we go through all this and and add it all up. And the accountant says, well, that puts you in the 22 percent tax bracket. And I'm like, that's freaking ridiculous that that is crazy low where taxes are at a 60 70 year low um which you know is good for us but we shouldn't have to that means we can't afford to pay for a lot of stuff and we shouldn't have to rely on the congress being full of a bunch of yahoos who can't get anything done to hold down spending. I mean, that's what's happening, that nothing gets passed. And so less gets spent, but that's a, a eventually going to be a disastrous way to run the country. Well, Rick, yeah, but modern monetary theory is even worse, is it not, Rick? Rick, where, where the government just spends whatever the hell they want and has the Fed buy up the debt of the Treasury, and this just gets into a vicious cycle. Which right, so we need some non-Yahoos to, to figure, uh, to, get, uh, to get on a like uh, figure out how these are. Well, that's largely what happened during COVID. Largely what happened during COVID is the the government spent a huge amount of money, over $6 trillion uh, dealing with COVID. uh, And most of that was financed by the Federal Reserve. So we basically were self-dealing in our own debt rather than paying market interest rates. That and several other things that we've talked about, supply chain disruption, et cetera, resulted in excess inflation. 
uh, and uh, you know, and, and, and so we, we, we are where we are, uh, but we've got to recognize that in order to put our finances in order, we're going to have to adopt pro growth policies, but you can't grow your way out. The math doesn't come close to working. Yes, we're going to have to reform social insurance programs to make them solvent, sustainable, secure. We're going to have to reprioritize and reduce projected discretionary spending, including defense. And we're going to have to have more revenues. You're going to have to do all of those things. All things have to be on the table, but all things aren't equal. And, and most Americans, by a significant majority, believe it's probably two to three to one spending constraint to revenues. But you got to have both. And the sooner we do it, the better off we're going to be. And one of my arguments is now we have this tentative agreement on appropriations and spending for fiscal 2024, which we're already into over three months, and we still haven't agreed on it yet, okay? But we need to couple that with this fiscal stability, debt commission, sustainability, I don't give a damn what you call it. We need to couple that agreement with something like that so we can actually start treating the disease. You know, we have fiscal cancer, all right? We need to aggressively treat it, and it's going to take a special mechanism that engages the American people, the facts, the truth, the tough choices, sets the table for an up or down vote. And so I'm hoping that they will come to that recognition because we cannot continue to do what we're doing uh, and ignore the reality that will result in a not bright future for American Americans if we don't. So I, uh, who's Jatovi's had his hand up for a while, and then I think Kim has too. Um, one thing I I, I think, uh, and Dave, I love having you on here because it's always fun talking to you. Um, one of the things that uh, you have brought up, which you know, and I I will stress in every show, is about honesty, and that's the big theme for me this year. And being honest is one thing that we need to be within the actual workings of the economy. One of the things that we keep doing, and I think uh, Jimmy called it a logical fallacy, uh, but also we cannot keep trying to sell that White House and the white picket fence. And we do that by saying, are you better off now than you were four years ago? The problem with that is we forget that COVID was going on at that time and jobs were being lost. People were out of work and oh, gas prices were low but that was because nobody could move around. Prices on groceries were low because people couldn't get to the stores to buy. So we're, we do this, well, were you better off? No, let's talk about, and honestly, one of the terms that uh, Shaq used talking about the natural workings of the economy, let's talk about the na how it would be based on the solutions that are put forth right now. What's going on right now in terms of inflation we brought up that it's a global issue and not a, 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 a an isolated issue just to the U.S. Inflation across the globe, yes, it's going down, but in the U.S. it's going down further than it has gone through across the globe. So that's that's my thing about being honest and um, about, uh, you know, the best way to educate our populace on financial literacy to the economy and how things are being spent. We have to be honest that Yes, I love that you always, and this is one thing, Dave, that I applaud you for every time you say it. We have to raise revenues. That means taxes have to go up. We keep lying to our populace saying that our taxes can't go up. And so when we do the whole, uh, are you better off now than four years ago? The first thing that pops up, but one of the things that pops up, well, taxes were. Well, taxes, we have to raise them if we're actually going to work our way out. It's part of one of the ways that we're going to work our way out of this deficit that we keep putting ourselves into. So I always applaud you when you bring up, yes, we have to raise more revenues. We're calling revenues, call it whatever. Yes, taxes has to have to go up. Well, the real question is uh, how much, in what form, and when, all right? But, but let me not deceive anybody. I mean, the, the problem is primarily a spending problem, but not exclusively. We are spending well in excess of the, uh, of the post-World War II historical average as a percentage of GDP, and it's going up rapidly. We are taxing somewhat less, 
than the post-World War II historical average as a percentage of GDP. And so the gap is growing, all right? So we need to bend the curve down on spending, and we need to bend the curve up some on revenues as a percentage of GDP. If we can get economic growth at a reasonable level, then we can end up reducing debt to GDP by growing the denominator faster than the numerator. But the people out there who tell you that we can grow our way out of this problem would fail math. The numbers don't come close to working. But here's the problem. We now have a republic, which is a representative democracy that is not representative of nor responsive to the general public. We have a disproportionate amount of Republicans that are on the far right. We have a disproportionate amount of Democrats that are on the far left. A vast majority of the country is in what I would call the sensible center, center right, center left. That's probably where we are, okay? That's where the solutions are. When you look at the margins in the House and the Senate, they're so close that every election is about control. Uh, you don't want to give the opposition a win. And so we end up getting frozen. If we were doing well, being frozen is not bad. But if we're not doing well and things are getting worse with the passage of time, I'm talking about financially, fiscally. I'm not talking about short-term numbers. Uh, structural. I'm talking about the structural. Then it's terrible. So so we, we, we need to be honest. Here's the word that I use for Toby. It's called integrity. Unfortunately, there's a big integrity deficit when you're talking about politics. On both, sides, on both sides. I can't do the politics in the US. I, I say US media. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of focus on from the, you know, abortion, immigration, you know, race relations, education disparities, etc. How often do you guys watch CNN and Fox or you know, any of these other channels and they actually have a proper conversation about the economy? I mean, what I think would be positive for the U.S. economy and what Jim uh, thinks is positive for the U.S. economy may be completely different things. But why not have that conversation? Uh, Jim uh, was, was gracious enough to invite me to, a, to his show where we talked about healthcare. And I was a little bit concerned because I didn't really think I knew very much about, it, about healthcare. But, you know, Jim, I've had four government people from four different countries contact me to ask me for my opinion on their healthcare systems as a result of that show. Um, they've looked me up on LinkedIn and I said, look, you know, I was just shooting from the hip, you know, just giving my opinion. I'm not an expert in this field. But this is the thing. People aren't talking anymore. People aren't actually having conversations about what can we do to actually fix the issues. And I think the US is going to have that issue with nobody really being prepared to talk about the economic issues that face the United States and what what can it do which is going to be positive, what may not be so positive, and also some tough decisions. Sometimes you have to put up a little bit of pain. Think about Japan, for example, that had to go through a very high inflationary and then deflationary period, but they now have one of the world's strongest economies. Think about for those people who, on my side of the political aisle, will say government needs to get out of the way, we shouldn't have central planning, we shouldn't have government, you know, too, too involved. Otherwise, you'll end up with, you know, socialist Venezuela and not have any toilet paper. That's a great argument, but why not focus on South Korea? South Korea had a government that said, look, we need to do something, and if we don't force local businesses to buy steel, then we can't have a steel industry, etc. So they actually controlled that for a period of time, and now South Korea earnings per capita, et cetera, South Korea is doing really well. So that's something that worked for them to build them into a position of strength. And now there's, you know, a distinct lack of government control there. Now they let entrepreneurs uh, do their thing. So I, I think that there's positive and negatives on both sides of the aisle, but people become so siloed into their political position that they're not prepared to acknowledge when their position isn't quite working and look for compromises, look for ways that things will actually work. And unfortunately, I think the, the US is the leader of the world in many things and polarization, I think it leads the world by a massive, massive amount. Who's next, Nick? Thank you very uh, much. Jatobi. Jatobi. Oh, just, just to push back. Um, yes, we're on an economic show, but those 
there are other things that are, as you said, issues. It's plural. Economics is just one issue. There are the issue around women's rights is another issue. The women, the issue around uh, equity and inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's another issue. There are there are a plentiful things that we need to work on, and that's the sad thing about this pat or the one eighteenth Congress, which hasn't passed really anything. It's been uh, you know it's uh, pushed out the least amount of laws, the least amount of. I think they've only done what twenty nine laws. But that, uh, that Jatobi, that's part of the gridlock, okay? Because yes, and I, I I completely agree with that's part of the gridlock and that's part of the problem. Yeah, but if look at we this. can get out and 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 if we can begin to negotiate and get out of that right now, I agree with Shat and I agree with you in terms of that gridlock issue. A lot of that is it really a two way? Hey, this side, both sides do it. It's actually more so one side than the other because more so one side is in charge than the other. I gotta get the dogs. They're running wild. Okay. I, I think if I think if your if your government can't can't actually pass laws, that's probably a positive thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, we can oh, agree man. disagree about that. Jack. Have to understand this, but <laughs> you have to understand this. Let me finish. Sure. You know, sometimes things will get passed in one house, and the other house won't take it up. And let's take an example. The, the House of Representatives passed a border security and immigration bill as one of the first things they did in early 2023. But the Senate has refused to take it up. So it's fair to say that the 118th Congress, meaning both sides, House and Senate, has largely have largely been ineffective. But that doesn't mean that that things haven't happened. The problem is they don't want to work together to get things done. So let's see what happens as part of this appropriations process, because that's a must pass bill. Right. And I think I'm against this false equivalency um, because right now a moderate, moderate Democrat can get elected. A moderate Republican cannot. The push to the far right is one side only. It's not on both sides equally. Uh, when we have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene being appointed to important committees, you know, something is wrong. Uh, we have to have people. I grew up in New England. The Republicans and Democrats worked together. There were no crazy Republicans that we knew of. Um, in Massachusetts, we elected Republican uh, governors, even though there was a Democratic controlled um, uh, House and and what the assembly and what we can say right now is this gridlock is primarily due to the mega hat wearers and the voting in people who are Trump supporters. And once they start losing enough elections, we'll get sane Republicans elected again. If we can get moderate Republicans again, this gridlock will end. There well, I, I wouldn't expect to, I, just, I, a I moment, wouldn't. just a moment, Dave. The people that used to work across the aisle, like Joe Biden, for example were prominent, they were common. And we've lost that ability now, and we've lost it because of the mega hat wearers. Thank All you. Right. First, first, let me say that I'm not a Trump fan, and by no means am I MAGA, all right? And you're right in your first statement that there aren't, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that the MAGA element wing of the Republican Party is, is part of the problem. That's why I'm saying it's far right. But don't kid yourself. The far left is in charge of the Democratic Party right now. Don't we can you. agree to disagree on that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He's a moderate. Biden's the moderate. I'm, a, I'm an honorary. That's not moderate. The far left is not a moderate. The, no, the, Biden's the, not far left. Hold, hold on. on. Let me let me finish. I'm an honorary blue dog Democrat, which is moderate de, moderate Democrats. I'm an honorary Main Street Republican, which is moderate Republicans. Those two are much smaller than they've ever been, okay? Much smaller than they've ever been. The numbers speak loudly. Both parties have gerrymandered to maximize their position to minimize competition, all right? That's true. I'm one of the national co-founders of No Labels. We founded the Problem Solvers Caucus, 64 members, 32 Democrats, 32 Republicans. They try to work together, but... The leadership is too far right and too far left. 
and in many cases don't want to compromise. That's not true. Yeah. That's not true. Oh, it's yeah, I'm right. here, Jim. I'm here. You're not. It's okay. too far right. I agree, but Joe Biden is not far one, left. One He's last thing. One last thing. One last thing. I, I just can't. The Joe Biden that. that I know. Hold on. The Joe Biden that I know was center left. He was not far yeah. left. But you're forgetting what was done. All right. Clyburn from South Carolina brokered a deal to give Biden the nomination. And here's what the deal and here's what the deal was. OK, I, uh, the deal was Biden was in fourth or fifth place. Yeah, I know. I remember going in a South Carolina. The deal was we will make you the nominee if you agree, agree to take the left agenda. If you agree to follow the left agenda of Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, AOC. Hold on. No. It's a fact, okay? It's not a fact. The Democrats will even admit it was a fact, all right? No, and it's so not what a fact. Happened is Bernie, Bernie Sanders all... didn't get elected, and her Bernie Sanders policies are not in place. Well, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders was the far left. Uh, they're, not, they're, not, they're not now, I would agree with you, because there was a change of control in 2020. Uh, 2023. No, I agree with we'll you. have to agree to disagree on that. Okay. And I don't care where you are or where I am. That's not the fact. Well, I'm right. telling you where the American people are. They don't like you. I'll, I'll, I'll go off to Rick. 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 All right. right. So one problem is the angry, lazy 24-hour news channels propping up a-holes in government. If you could wave a wand and make Fox, CNN, MSNBC go away, there'd be a certain amount of healing. And an associated problem is the major part of the job for many people in Congress is fundraising. 20 hours a week legislating or sitting in the House and 20, 25, 30 hours a week going into a separate office building and cold calling people and begging for money. And a lot of the people who are okay with that aspect of the job are kind of a-holes who suck at a lot of at, at actually getting things done. Well, that's why you need campaign finance reform, but that's going to take a, that's going to take a constitutional amendment. And we need so, yeah. so let me just let me just address a couple, a couple of things there. I, I find the the um, dichotomy there between uh, between Jim and David to be very interesting and I think very typical of what I've seen, what I've observed, my experience in the United States, which is Democrats will often say to me, we are moderate. Look how far right Republicans are. Republicans that I meet will say, we are the moderates and look how far left the Democrats are. And That's then awesome. I turn around and I say, well, I'm a moderate. And I think, oh, gee, am I am I really hard right? Because my left friends say that I am and my right friends say that I'm quite, quite on the left. I think this is the real issue here is that if you actually set aside the labels of everything and you actually look at what, what we call the extremes on both sides are saying, on the, on the progressive left, you have a lot of people that are saying, this is bullshit. We can't afford to pay our bills. We can't afford to get health care. We can't afford groceries. We can't afford to rent a house. Our children have to live with us until they're 30. Or now I think the, the age age has gone up to 35. The kids aren't moving out of the parents' homes until they're 35 because they can't afford a house. This is terrible. Why is wealth distributed this way? We need to do something about it. And they get called hard left-wing socialists, progressives, etc. On the right, you have people that are being labelled MAGA extremists. But when you actually sit down and talk to a lot of the people that, you know, would fall into that category, a lot of them don't have particularly extreme views in my experience. A lot of them are saying, look, we're struggling over here. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to work and we have all these issues. We have all the, you know, governments that's working against us and now they want us to use these special pronouns and do all this other stuff and I can't keep up with it. All I want to do is... You know, I'm a mechanic. I want to work in the in the car factory. I want to, you know, be a welder or, or do whatever it is that they're doing. And I think that that's where the big disconnect is. There's a, a massive disconnect yeah. between people that have a bit of an education, understand how government works, and the working class that aren't living in that world, that aren't actually focused on race, sexual sexuality, gender, all that sort of stuff. They're just trying to live their lives. And I think that there's people on both sides of this aisle that feel very attacked. And when somebody with charisma and a big personality appeals to that group, there's a big part of that group then that, that gets together and then becomes labelled as progressive leftists or mega Republicans. And the big question for the United States is, what's going to happen in 2028? Whether Trump wins or doesn't win the next election, 
he's unlikely, I would hope anyway, he'd be unlikely to contest the 2028 election if he loses and if he wins, of course, he can't contest that election. What does the future look like for both Republicans and Democrats? It should be positive because you should have some young blood on both sides. But what are the arguments going to be? What are the issues that they're going to be standing for? And as you've talked about, David and Walker, we have this, or you guys have this massive issue with your Medicare trust funds running out of money, your Social Security trust funds running out of money. And this is coming live in the next one, two, three election cycles. So who's actually going to be up there and who's going to have proper conversations and, and articulate a proper plan forward? Yeah, um, well, that's why, that's why, you have to have two things. You have to have this commission that I've been advocating for, which has a major responsibility for citizen education engagement, the facts, the truth, the tough choices, where we are, where we've been, where we're headed, how do we compare to others? Everything is on the table, but not everything is equal. Then be able to come back and make a package of recommendations, guaranteed up or down vote, can't be filibustered uh, in, in the Senate. And there are bills in both the House and the Senate that, are, that embrace that. The speaker's for it. Uh, and it ought to be part of this budget appropriations deal that they're working on now. Because the people are way ahead of the politicians. And the people are where the answers are. Not hey, in, Dave, yeah. Dave, I just want to push back on something you said earlier. And actually, I have like sure. many people on this panel, a great deal of respect for you and all along those lines. But... There is you, you mentioned the brokering deal and the brokering deal that came from South Carolina. I've heard that brokering deal conversation before and everything. But ironically, and this is actually what Shaquille may find interesting as well, there is a number of people that have actually pushed back against Representative Clyburn because they felt that they were a part of the deal that they did not get. Because there are a number of people that are in the quote unquote, and I did use it in the, the air quotes for a reason, a reparations movement that are upset because they feel that Clyburn was supposed to actually push for reparations and all along those lines. And that's actually the left that is actually pushing against Clyburn and not the right, because they are feeling that he is not doing what he was supposed to have done according to what they felt was a brokered deal, similar to what you were talking about and everything. So yeah, that's my, yeah, yeah, it plays that, out. There are a that, number of left that, that are quite that, upset at him. That's my understanding. By the way, I got this information from representatives of the DNC in South Carolina. Well, of course. Yeah. Of yeah. course, that's true. But it, your conclusion that the Bernie Sanders, Sanders policies are being implemented is wrong. Whoa, 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 Jim. All right. Let me just say one last thing. We're going to have to agree to disagree. I'm talking about in 2021 and 2022. I'm not talking about now. I totally agree with you now. They're not being implemented now because they can't be implemented now because you now have a divided house. And let me reinforce. I'm an independent. I'm center right. I'm fiscal conservative, social moderate. I think the country's in the middle. Our elected representatives are not, or at least not enough of them. Okay. Yeah, and this is where we disagree. I still say a moderate Democrat can get elected. A moderate Republican cannot. This is what's got to be fixed, and I think it's going to take a couple of long Well, there are moderate moderate. Republicans now because because they're in the Problem Solvers Caucus, okay? I mean, Brian Brian Fitzpatrick, who's a moderate Republican, former FBI agent, co-chairman of uh, of the Problem Solvers Caucus, represents suburban Philadelphia, which is a swing district. Okay, there are exceptions. I'm not saying that. that It's it's 100%. Come on. No, we no. have to be real here. No, and, but the fact of the matter is, is that the primary people are getting primaried if they're moderate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, this is what's got to change. On both sides. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you, that's you, you both you need to be, is what I'm objecting to. It's not the same on both sides. If you are a moderate Democrat, you don't get primary by someone further to the left and lose. You do on the Republican side. And when that changes, we'll have moderates on the right and left again that work across the aisle again. We this just not the change. Change. The Republican side Put it out, Jim. We're, we don't agree, okay? We do not yeah, agree. I don't see threaten to primary moderate moderate Democrats. Many of the squad members have threatened to, to primary moderate Democrats. But they don't win. Yeah, but but All we right. should let's, let's be not economic. Economic. We're, we're not politics. supposed to be talking about this. Uh, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, we're, we're, well, this is the economic show. We yeah. can reserve this for yeah. world politics, yeah. which is on Tuesday and Thursday live at the yeah. network. Uh, coming up on the econ- on economics, we're going to be bringing in uh, Dennis Stearns, who is a multi-billion-dollar 
money manager to go over the economic forecast. We also have on deck the president of the National Center for Financial Education, and uh, he's, he's going to be on our future shows probably this month. And then we also have a professor at University of Maryland, a professor of economics. So they're all going to be showing up on this network in the going future. In the meantime, we want to stick with the economy because politics is a big conversation. And we'll bring in Rick Rosner. Rick. Right. So we talk about how AI is going to kick our asses. But what nobody is honest about is the technology has already been kicking our asses. We have a ton of jobs. You know, unemployment is super low, but the jobs are sucky. The jobs have been, technology has helped strip out the economic benefits of a lot of jobs. Take a look at being an Uber driver. That's a fake job. That's a job where if you factor in all the costs, um, you might not even be making minimum wage. And jobs like that have been made possible by disruptive technologies and all the profits from this disruption go to the freaking tech oligarchs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically a winner take all economy, which seems to be uh, heading. I think Jatovi is up now. He's driving Uber right now to make a living. <laughs> like ah! hey, you live in the dream. So, uh, yeah. We're going in Uber, uh, Jatovi. Well, honestly, just to point out, Rick is correct on the AI and the way the AI is going to change a lot. And we have to be, that's another thing we have to be honest about. They're already dealing with self-driving cars. Yeah, it has a problem right now. However, once that gets nailed down, bye-bye Uber driver. That's what the future looks like. Is there's a lot of that there's a lot of stuff that's going to lean heavily on AI, computations, data. I mean, data has been the big business that everybody has kind of ignored until now because data within itself, honestly, everything that we use that's free is grabbing your data so they can sell your data and make any search or anything that you receive be it uh, YouTube, Facebook, email, doesn't matter what you're on. Once you jump on the computer, it knows what you're doing and it's trying to basically uh, 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 send you information around that. And people are waking up to that fact and understanding that data, computers, AI, that's, that's the future. That's big business. And that's where the economy needs to start angling towards because, uh, yeah, you can create a robot to do anything. We're at the hour, I think. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah. We're at the hour. I just want to know oh. if uh, Jatobi's dog had an opinion because apparently the dog was trying to give. I mean, that's why I'm in the car right now because.